Good morning and welcome to our March panel event for the So What But What If campaign. We're a gender-based approach to safety, creating a safer future for younger generations. Collaboration made with myself from One for Growth, Laura from Glasgow Girls Club and Ashley from Thrive and Survivors. So today our panel is slightly different. Rather than going into a specific subject uh, around safety, we are celebrating the success of women um, carrying on International Women's Day and just dragging it out through the month as we should. So we have got four uh, panelists with us today and we're gonna be hearing from each of them. <clears throat> so first of all, we're gonna be hearing from Madeline Black. And then we'll hear from Maddie from uh, Thriving Survivors and the So What campaign um, about inspirational women through the ages. We'll then hear from Samantha Billingham and last but not least, Jill Baird. So I'll be keeping an eye on questions in the Facebook group. So please do, if you've got any questions for any of our panelists as we go, put them in the comments. Um, and likewise to our panelists, please do ask each other questions. Um, at the end of the event, I will tell you all about an exciting um, addition to our campaign that will be launching on the 15th of April, and then a little bit more about our next panel event. But for me, this is the best panel I've done because I have very little to do and I just get to listen to everybody else, which is a pleasure. So without um, wasting any more time, we'll go straight on to Madeline. So Madeline, if you want to start, just give us a wee introduction and oh. then over to you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to come along to this panel today. So I am Madeleine Black. I am a former psychotherapist. I'm an author. I'm an international speaker. I am a podcast host, which was really my gift of lockdown. And I'm a sexual violence activist. And I know today we're meant to talk about our successes and how we get got to where we are at. But really, I feel it's all been, I used to call myself an accidental speaker. You know, I never, ever wanted to speak out about what had happened to me or all my journey because I guess it was really my shame that kept me quiet for years. And it, it took me literally um, 35 years to share my story publicly, which I don't suggest that everybody does. But it took me a long time of healing, of therapy, of really acceptance to be in a place where I could speak out. And, you know, I, I'm not the first person ever to speak out about sexual violence or, or a woman that's been raped, gang raped. And I really feel that I am standing on the shoulders of many, many other people. For those of you that kind of know a little bit about my story, I first shared it with the Forgiveness Project, which is an amazing charity in London, which, as it suggests, it's all about forgiveness. They're... Um, founder asked me if I would share my story with them on their website and she said you know I could be anonymous I didn't need to put my photo up and I was umming and ahhing because it was quite a big decision for me because a lot of my friends might have known that I'd been raped as a 13 year old but they maybe didn't know all the details and this was an opportunity to really I guess end my shame completely by doing the very thing that I was so embarrassed about. Now most of their events took place in London and I was I'm living in Glasgow, obviously, and there was an event that was taking place in Shawlands Academy, which is like two minutes from where I live. And it was with this extraordinary woman called Marion Partington. Now, her sister, Lucy Partington, was murdered by Rose and Fred West. And Marina said to me, you know, there's an event in Glasgow. This is where it's at. Is that near to you? I said, it's like two minutes from where I live. So I, I went along. It was like an interfaith meeting. And it was to do with all the school children as well. I think the fifth and sixth years were, were working with Mary and doing um, workshops around forgiveness because she has shared her story in prisons for about 10 years about her sister and what happened to her and how she came to a place of forgiveness and peace, finally. And it was just brilliant to meet Marion because she's also one of the other stories from the Forgiveness Project. And Marina, I, she doesn't call us storytellers, she calls us story healers. And, and like her now, I believe in the power that comes when we share our stories. And I met Marion, obviously, we had a huge hug in the days when that was just normal. We didn't need to check and say, do you mind if we hug? And uh, she had, I bought her book that night and I turned the cover over when I got home and it said, now you must speak. And I was like, you know, 
I could do that. I, I could share my story too. And the moment I had that thought, um, just at night, I started to see the words and words from my, I didn't realize then, but from my book, all these chapter headings and all the words came into me. And I thought, I'm just going to write my story down for me. And literally in about eight weeks, I had written 70,000 words. And I thought, kind of looks like a book. <laughs> and I had no idea about the publishing process, how you go about doing that. But I bought the Bible that everybody buys called the Writers and Artist Handbook. And I sent away my um, synopsis, my first three chapters and my covering letter to about 25 publishers. I think I got rejected by 24. Some I still have never heard from and one, obviously, it's all you need, decided to take the risk and publish me, which is now Gosh, it's now, yeah, five years ago, six years ago, nearly, in April will be six years. And um, it, it just blew me away, you know, sharing my story with the Forgiveness Project publicly and then becoming an author. And then I was asked to speak, you know, to share my story once I did both of those things. And it, it's really interesting. I thought that I would just be so nervous or so ashamed or just it would be too much for me. But the moment I stand there and I'm invited to speak and I share my story, something, I don't know where it comes from, something comes in now and I think it calms me, even though I do get nervous, I do get butterflies, and, but I'm able to ground myself, which I guess is what I've spent my whole life of recovery doing, is learning to ground myself and to heal myself by connecting back in because I kind of left my body for years. You know, I was like um, a house that I rented with no furniture inside of me. So I was a shell for years. So that's been a lot of my journey. So I was able to use my mindfulness, or whatever, awareness to get back in my body. And I just think, well, it's not about me anymore speaking. It's now about who's listening. And from the very, very first event I ever did, which actually a fire alarm went off in the middle. It was a university in, in Kiel. I'll never forget that one. Somebody had burnt the toast in the kitchen. And we all had to leave. But straight away, you know, the questions that came up, well, that happened to me as well. And I always felt embarrassed or, or in the interval, people would speak to me or after the event, people would message me privately because they were too ashamed to stick their hand up, you know, during a live conference. And I really started to see the power that comes, you know, when we share our stories, that um, it's about what it can do for other people. And so... With me, I, I'm not a very good business person at all. I really just kind of trust life and I just let whatever comes in kind of lead me. So I just thought, well, if I'm meant to speak, you know, people will ask me to speak. And, and literally from every event I do, somebody will then ask me to speak somewhere else. And I joined the Professional Speaking Association because I thought, you know, I don't really know how to do this. I went for one training event with a friend of mine called Richard McCann, which some of you may have heard of. His mother was the first victim of Peter Sutcliffe, who was known as another name, but he doesn't like to call him by that name. So he said, go to the PSA, you know, they'll be your tribe and they will help. They won't find you speaking events, but, you know, you'll learn a lot from them. And it's been the most amazing journey with them when I went to... One of the first conferences I think I went to, I sat down at a table at lunch and someone said, what do you speak about? And then I said, oh, just here, I have a copy of my book. And he was from Johannesburg. And it was around that time when I was asked to speak more and more. And I was still working as a psychotherapist in Glasgow in the Tom Allen Centre. And I thought, you know, I don't think I can juggle both now because the speaking events are becoming more and more and I want to be a good therapist as well but I was getting torn you know I saw that it's great to do the one-to-one -one work but I thought now it's about doing one-to-many you know when I speak into an audience of hundreds the largest audience live audience when we used to do that was 2,000 people at my TEDx in Glasgow I just thought the ripple effect is, is going to go further and Paul contacted me and around when he contacted me it was like January time and I'd been having thoughts about stopping working as a psychotherapist and maybe just focusing on speaking more and I was working towards an ending with all of the clients that I had and I thought to myself you know if I'm meant to be a speaker then I need a sign that this is going to be the right path for me to take um, I would love to work internationally and I thought oh well you know I'll just put that out there that's that's never gonna happen but Paul 
contacted me literally on January the 1st and he invited me to speak at the Professional Speakers Association conference in Johannesburg and I thought oh that's quite good I quite like the idea of that and in the same week I was contacted by um, somebody who'd come to see me at a book event in London she was from the Maldives and I didn't know at the time because we never know who is in our audience that she used to be the health minister at the Maldives in the Maldives and she said, oh, she's putting a conference together, it's sponsored by UNICEF, would I like to be a speaker? Well, obviously, I didn't have to think twice about going to the Maldives. You know, it was my first paid event. The PSA was not a paid event, but it was an amazing experience. And I'd listened to somebody else um, at one of our PSA events. And they said, if you're going to another country, see if you can arrange other events while you're there. And I have a, a friend who I met in real life in Johannesburg, a fantastic woman, uh, we actually met through a book club on Facebook and um, she knew about my story, had read my book. She's a South African living in Australia and I know she does a lot of work with um, the Angel Network and they help people that are disadvantaged in South Africa, men, women, children. And she said they would love to, me to do an event for them. So I did another event with the Angel Network and they also got me to speak on a radio station. My best part of South Africa when I was there was that... Um, the Angel Network really raised a lot of money for orphanages. A lot of babies are abandoned in South Africa. One little baby that was there was found in a drain, just abandoned, which kind of as a mum, as a woman, it obviously broke my heart. But on the Monday, they said, would you like to come to the orphanage? And I said, yeah. So I spent two hours just holding babies, <laughs> cuddling babies. I mean, there were literally two nursery nurses to look after about 10 babies. And, and that was it. So they, they had their work cut out. I, as you can see, I, I don't really prepare even when I do a talk. So I never know that I was going to end up talking about cuddling babies. But I guess really my message to everyone is, you know, what I've always done is once I decided to be a speaker is I've just said yes. You know, anytime anybody asks me to speak, I just go, yeah, why not? Let's let's go for it. I just say yes. Obviously, it has to fit in with my diary and everything. But I just say yes. And my career was was going places. It was fantastic. In February 2020, I was asked to be the closing keynote at a big speakers conference in Namibia, which obviously to be the opener or to be the closer is one of the main spots that you can have. It was brilliant. And then, as we all know, March 2020, lockdown came in. So uh, my career that was going there it was like, oh my gosh, I've stopped working as a therapist. What am I going to do? And, and I was one of these people that said, oh, it will just be done in a few weeks. I'll, I'll wait till it's over. Then we'll be back in the room. But as we all know, that wasn't quite the case. And so I think that's why I decided to start my podcast. You know, I know so many extraordinary people through the Forgiveness Project and another project I'm involved with called the Global Resilience Project, who speak to thrivers. And I just thought it was such a dark, dark time, but I wanted to share some positivity, some hope, and just to get these stories of thriving out to people, to show them, look, if they can be the first woman as a quadriplegic to climb the Himalayas and, you know, on her hands and knees, look what you can do. We can all get past this pandemic. So that's what I've done. I've, I interview people, the podcast episode goes out every week. And I, I love sitting in their fantastic energy and I get to share their stories with other people. My guest this week is an amazing man called, oh, sorry, that's my co-host, my dog, who often appears in my podcast, that's Alfie. Sorry about that, just working from home. So Dennis this week grew up in the slums of Manila and he's gone on to be one of the biggest um, known psychology bloggers, has a hugely successful YouTube channel, um, puts on conferences, you know, has uh, written books, and you just think he's a perfect example of where we start doesn't determine where we finish. So I guess really what I want to say before I kind of wind up here is it took me a long, long time to find my voice, and I know that a lot of people can't speak out yet because of their shame. It, it's crippling, and it held me back for years, and I, I know all about that shame. But I feel like if I can speak out now, that it is my duty. And I will really continue to speak out, whether that's virtually, in person, online, until 
I no longer have any breath because this now really, I guess I'm a, maybe a more of a, a purpose driven speaker. This is my my reason now. I think if I can speak out, then this is really what I'm here to do. So I say it's all been accidental, but I also say yes to everything. So I guess it's about taking chances and, and trusting life. So that's me in a nutshell, really. <laughs> thank you so much. Madeline, thank you so much. Um, as you know, I've heard Madeline speak loads of times and you're always, you do, you always say yes when I say, can you come and speak at this event? Come and speak at this event. Can you do this panel event? And you always say yes. And um, so it's nice to actually today to hear how you know, your journey and uh, what's inspired you to get to where you are. Because um, normally it's about your story, which is uh, different. So it's a nice to, nice to hear that today. Has anyone got any questions for Madeline? Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. I didn't know Madeline's story before hearing this today. And wow, it's absolutely fantastic to hear how much she's overcome and what an amazing example she sets to, to other women. I'm going to speak about something kind of similar, not in the, the, the same kind of severity as what Madeline's gone through, but she spoke about shame. Um, and I've just wondered, because she is a psychoanalyst, like, has, has, is this something that consistently comes up and is the shame and the embarrassment about speaking out and the fear of speaking out for upsetting those around you? Is that something that she experienced? And, and what advice would you have to people that are in that situation just now? Yep, thank you. I guess um, before lockdown, I did a TEDx and then I did another one virtually. And it's actually it's not been aired yet because it was TEDx University of Glasgow and the students had a bit of problem with the licensing. But I hope it comes up soon because it's called Why I'm Shaming Shame. So it's all about shame. And I just know that you know, shame can't exist uh, when we bring light to it. So the very way that we hide from shame and we keep it in the darkness, it grows it. So by doing the very thing that we think we can't possibly do, which takes guts, it takes fear and it takes courage, um, that's the only way to shatter the shame is what I talk about. You know, every time I stand in my shame, I shatter it. And every time I speak out or another survivor speaks out, we help someone else to find their voice. It is a ripple effect. So most of the shame that people hold on to is inappropriate shame. You know, I held on to this shame that these two men had raped me for years, thinking that people would look at me differently. Mm -hmm. They would be disgusted how I was disgusted, or they would think I was worthless. But I know now 100% of all rapes really come down to rapists. You know, nothing yeah. else. The shame Never I held moment. on to for years, it wasn't ever mine. So that is the message I want to give people. Whatever you're ashamed about, it's not your shame, it's just how society treats sexual violence, whether it's about sexual violence, it's it's all our own judgments, it's victim blaming, you know, I could, sorry, Heather, I could take over and speak here all day, but I will, I will stop there. Just know that the shame is, is never yours to start with, but it's, it's something, if you recognise you have shame and it's misplaced, it's something that you can really work through with someone. Thanks, Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Oh, that was lovely. That was a powerful speech, Madeline. Um, I've followed you on Twitter for a while, but I've never heard you speak. Um, and my question is, I saw a quote that you, you'd said, and the quote was, I used to think that they were evil, but I started to understand that they didn't come into this world that way. And I just wanted to know how long it took you before you came to that point in your story, oh. in your journey decades and decades and you know um, it was really when I was going through therapy the last time my eldest daughter had become 13 the age that I was and my therapist you know suggested to me that maybe they weren't born rapists which sent me on this journey of wanting to needing really to understand how could they come into how could they behave like that so it's it took a lot of work and and again i guess i was an accidental forgiver because i i was filled with rage and hate and it wasn't healthy for me it had nothing to do with them for me to get to that place it, you know the hate and the anger and the revenge was eating me up inside and making me unwell so when i is my own personal opinion, you know, I chose forgiveness. I'm not telling people you have to forgive because I know people find that quite a provocative subject. The Forgiveness Project exhibition is called the F word for that very reason because it does, you know, bring up a lot of conversation. But for me, it just allowed me to understand that, yeah, I think we're all born a blank sheet, a blank canvas, and we get corrupted, we get conditioned. But yeah, it was a, a real journey to 
walk that one out but it eventually just led me to peace and stop getting triggered and stop getting so affected but it's 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 not a marathon <laughs> it's it is you know it's not a sprint sorry it is a marathon this journey of healing and we think we've come so far and we're okay then bam another layer just rises up so yeah it definitely is a journey a thank journey. you Welcome. Samantha Maddie you've got a question don't you yeah, it's actually, it's actually quite similar to Samantha, so if that's okay. But um, oh. I've heard you speak before, Madeline, and um, I've noticed you keep bringing up that F word, forgiveness. <laughs> um, I get the sense that it has a real forward momentum to it. I'm really interested in the idea of forgiveness as empowerment. But as you say, it's quite controversial. Um, and I was just kind of wondering, yeah, how, how long it took you to get to that place? And, and, um, and maybe it wasn't quite a difficult journey in that way as well. Yeah, as I said, it was never my intention. It was only when it was suggested to me and somehow the idea of forgiveness and the irony is that I went onto the Forgiveness Project's website and I started to read all these stories of people forgiving. You know, I've, I've now interviewed a lot of them as well. And I was like, oh, if, if they can do that. And I saw the results of what came from that as well. And, and as you've heard me speak, you know, it, it was never about um them it was always about me what forgiving could do for me so in some ways it was about understanding it was acceptance because my mind just got caught up in denial for years and years and years i didn't want to believe what i was being shown when i saw all these pictures and all these memories i just thought and i worked at women's aid for 14 years rape crisis for six years i just thought i'd made up it was all other women's stories that none of it was true and the more i denied it obviously what we resist persists so the more the memories came in and just flooded me so yeah i, I never wanted to forgive them at all i was determined to hate them until the day i died but it was for me it was really as you you've heard me say it was an act of self-love it was totally free it was a choice that i could make quietly in my heart and it was totally totally self-empowering nothing to do with them at all so it is a choice there's many many paths to healing but this is the one that i chose in the end Madeline, thank you so much and thank you everyone for your questions so next up we have maddie and maddie you're going to take us through uh, three women who have inspired you through the ages that's right. Yes. So um, for those of you who haven't met me, my name's Maddie, as Heather said. Um, so I'm working as a freelance writer and researcher at the moment. Uh, I also work for Thriving Survivors. And in autumn, I'll be starting a PhD in literature. So I studied literature and history in my undergrad and master's. So I'm aware of the myriad of ways women have had to be rewritten into historical narratives because of their prior exclusion. Of course, women have always achieved great things, which is why I'm going to be talking about the, su the success of women in history to you today. So I'll just get my uh, PowerPoint up. Fabulous, I love a PowerPoint. Okay, <laughs> oh, whoops. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, so when I was asked to um, narrow down my presentation to just three women, I had a really difficult time choosing because there are just countless examples of women who have achieved so much, whether they've contributed significant findings in science, humanities, arts, politics, or to positive social change. There are really just too many to choose from. So the ones that I did choose this panel of discussion are women whose actions I feel embody feminist values of care, community and compassion. Okay, so first up is Marlene Dietrich, known primarily as an actress born in Germany, but emigrating to America in the 1930s to work in Hollywood. When the Second World War started in 1939, despite America's lack of involvement and Nazi agents trying to bribe her to come back to Germany, Marlene started war bond drives and a fund for Jewish refugees to escape Nazi persecution. She remained openly and vocally anti-Nazi, uh, most epitomized in an incident while in North Africa where she was delivering a radio broadcast for the Armed Service Network, sorry, the Armed Forces Network. She'd been asked to sing a popular wartime song that had been banned by the Nazi German government, fitting, fittingly called Little Marlene. After performing the song, she went off script speaking very quickly in German. Boys, don't sacrifice yourselves. The war is shit. Hitler is an idiot. The army announcer took her microphone away as this was a broadcast for American troops. 
but she was sure that German soldiers would hear it on unofficial radio stations set up by the US government. Marlene described the work she did for the war effort as the only important thing I've ever done. Okay, next up, I would like to chat about Lillian Boloka, nicknamed Big Lil, a working class woman from Hull. She became head of the Headscarf Revolutionaries, a group of women seeking safer conditions and regulations for fishermen in their community. So after the triple, triple trawler tragedy in Hull in 1968, during which 58 men from three different fishing boats drowned, Lillian saw that the men in her community and her loved ones were at risk. Ignoring rules that banned women from the docks, she campaigned there relentlessly, as well as giving interviews at the docks to news stations in order to gain publicity. Her campaigning culminated in her gathering 10,000 signatures for a petition to strengthen safely, safety legislation for those working on trawlers. She then travelled to London and threatened to picket then Prime Minister Harold Wilson's house if he did not take action. Government ministers later implemented all of the measures outlined in the petition, including better safety equipment, improvements to training, legal standards for radio equipment and reporting procedures. Today, there is a plaque dedicated to Lillian on Coltman Street in Hull, near where she lived. Ian Cuthbert, who campaigned for the plaque, had this to say about Lillian and the headscarf re revolutionaries. It was one of the greatest acts of civil disobedience in the 20th century. These women turned an industry on its head and saved countless lives. Okay, lastly, I wanted to give some space to Marsha P. Johnson, who is best known for her involvement in the Stonewall Riots in 1969 in New York. These riots were a response to police harassment and violence towards the LGBT community and were a catalyst for the gay rights movement within the US and globally during the 1970s. Although Marsha had dropped a bag full of bricks from a lamppost onto the windshield of a police car during the riots, she had been largely left out of the narrative because she was a trans woman, drag queen and sex worker. For instance, David Carter's book about the Sto Stonewall riots notes that the other activists later changed their accounts of the riots to exclude Marsha, fearing that her gender identity and involvement in sex work could be used to discredit the newly emerging gay liberation movement. Now with sex worker rights and trans liberation movements in full swing, Marsha is receiving more and more recognition for her involvement. Perhaps less known about her though, is that she was the co-founder of STAR, which stands for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, an organization which sheltered LGBT youth escaping abusive households. Later in life, she was also involved with AIDS activism through ACT UP, which became an international movement to improve the lifespan and quality of life of people living with AIDS. ACT UP paved the way for thousands of people living with AIDS today to access treatment which gives them an equal or longer lifespan than those who are unaffected. Marsha was known for her floral style, wearing discarded florist flowers and fake fruit in her hair, and liked to say the P in her name stood for pay it no mind. Her community knew her as a sweet person, which she could pull off even while rioting. When Jean Deventi, another protester, was knocked down and kicked in the face by a police officer, Marsha used her own blouse to stop the bleeding. She reportedly told her, get up girl, we got a fight on our hands. Devente would go on to serve as Grand Marshal of the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, which is a yearly celebration of the Stonewall Riots and its accomplishments. So um, that's all from me, just a short presentation there, but um, I wanted to give a shout out to this lovely book that I own. Um, I actually got it as a Christmas present. <laughs> It has, um, it's called The Little uh, Book of Feminist Saints, and it has really lovely descriptions, stories, and illustrations of successful and innovative women from a range of different time periods and from across the globe. Um, some of the stories I relate here of uh, Marsha P. Johnson and uh, Marlene Dietrich come from this book, so I can highly recommend it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Amazing, thank you so much, Mary. Do you know, it's really nice to hear about um, women that have inspired and made changes through history that we probably don't normally hear of. And I was particularly interested in Marsha because as part of this campaign, um, we are going to be looking at uh, the trans community and sex workers as well and the views and opinions that 
have been created around those communities um, and the whole safety campaign in general. So um, that was a really, really fitting as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, any, any questions for I've Maddie? got a question, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so it was very difficult for you to choose um, the women that you're going to talk about today as you only had three. Who else was on your list that you would have liked to speak, spoken about today? Well, so I'm glad you've asked. <laughs> there's just, there's so many. And I, I, I think about it a lot because um, I'm going to tell you a quick story. But when I was maybe 14 or 15, I listened to this podcast and it was a gaming podcast. And it was by these, run by these guys in Bristol. And um, they had their girlfriend on one time and they were talking about, like one of them mentioned something like, oh, women have never invented anything. Or they said something akin to that. And the girlfriend was like, yeah, we have. Um, and bear in mind, this was maybe 10 years ago, but she did a quick Google search and she was like, oh yeah, well, admittedly, you know, women have invented things, but it's mostly like feminine things like tampons. And, and not to not to discredit those inventions, they're very important, but it's just not true. Like computing science was invented by Ada Lovelace, someone that I would have talked about as well. She was the daughter of Lord Byron and uh, she was the first person to um, give an engine, so a mechanical engine rather than a computer, but um, give an engine a series of instructions to follow using letters and numbers. So she was like essentially the inventor of computer programming and to not even have that be recognized is just I mean it's a tragedy really um so that's the one I would have talked about um the other person I would have liked to talk about is Henrietta Levitt who um basically she wasn't allowed to use telescopes at the university that she worked at but she managed to figure out nonetheless that um the kind of nebulas that we see far away are actually distant galaxies that have their own planets and things like that. So she was able to just work that out. <laughs> just crazy, crazy um, that despite the barriers, there are so many women who have contributed significantly to um, knowledge and uh, to so many things. And I, I really love these women because I think they did so much to instill positive change. Um, especially I, I really love Lillian's story because to me that's so important that you see someone in your community suffering regardless of their gender it was mostly men who were who were facing these dangerous conditions and I think it's a truly feminist act to go right this is an aunt we got to do something about this and mm. I resent the stereotype that that feminists are, are men hating right like I think that is just so untrue and it's just not not what we see in the history of feminist movements at all so I'm um, sorry that was a very long-winded answer but <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> Madeline did you have a question? It was just really an observation I didn't know about Marlena Dietrich um, singing that song uh, and to me I, you maybe don't know that I am a daughter of a holocaust survivor so my dad you, you'll get to read that part Maddie in my book but so my dad was a holocaust survivor but it just sums up what I love about women just being brave and bold and speaking out, you know, among, it must have been so dangerous for her to speak out against the Nazi regime, knowing that not just Jews were sent to the camps, but anyone that spoke out against Hitler, for her to do that, what courage, it's just like, oh, that just really moved me when I heard you mm -hmm. say that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm just grateful to her for <laughs> and for you for highlighting that, because I, I should know that really as a second generation that she, survivor that she had done that but um yeah thank you for sharing it shows you how many women have gone unnoticed like maddie said through history and, and Jill. your voice to oh, help sorry. is just what i love <laughs> So um, the, the question I wanted to ask was about um, the gender aspects of what's, in, what's included in the project. Um, I, I think by now most people know that I'm very well affiliated with the trans community, not just with the work that we do at Kids Medicare with the reassignment surgery, but also my own child is male to female trans, um, which means was born male and has transitioned to female. But one of the things that um, I noticed that when, as women, we're talking about gender identity and it tends to focus more on trans women, which is born male transition to female, as I said, um, but there's also a large part of the community which are non-binary or female to male. Um, I would probably say about 75% of the patients that we see at Kids Medicare are, were born female, um, identify as male or non-binary, and they're looking to transition to have 
modifications, usually mastectomies to, to transition to live as male or um or not be discriminate in their in their gender. And I feel that they, they really don't get included in the conversation. And a large part of their life, usually up until their teens, they've lived as female and the feminist movement almost doesn't include them in the in the pro choice as to what you do with your body and the decisions that you make going forward. And I feel really it would be fantastic if, as women, we supported their decision to, to kind of make their choices for their own body the same way as we support other choices for women in, in their healthcare journeys as well. So I'm just wondering, um, as part of this project, is is there any sort of consideration for the non-binary community and the the um, trans male community? So I'm gonna come out of the closet live. <laughs> I'm actually I actually identify as non-binary. Um, I use they their pronouns. Did you just yeah. Come out, like, seriously? Yeah. Oh my god! Congratulations! <laughs> oh my god! Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, it's a difficult one because I understand that I present quite femininely, but I also just feel like that is the truth about myself and all my friends use they them pronouns. They refer to me as a person or, you know, they use gender neutral terms for me, which I really love. That's that's how I like to be seen by other people. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. It's it's a really lovely thing. And it's I think it's for me identifying as non-binary is about being part of a community more than anything else it's it's I've encountered so many online communities of non-binary people supporting one another telling them each other like you don't have to dress in a certain way you don't have to act in a certain way like you are who you are and that's been so empowering and it's also for me a very political statement about not believing in a rigid gender binary I think I encompass a lot of different gendered attributes. Um, they might the ones that kind of present outwardly might seem more feminine, but that doesn't encompass the whole of me. Um, so I definitely feel strongly about that. I'm hoping we're going to talk a lot more about non-binary perspectives in our queer panel that's going to come up. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think maybe the discrepancy that comes in is that you know obviously I'm here today talking about the success of women because um, I am a feminist, I'm a strong feminist. And when people talk about women's issues, I identify with that so much because I was raised as a girl and I lived as a woman until about a year ago. And um, so obviously these issues affect me. Um, and it's gonna be a difficult process, I think, because we use the word women so much as a shorthand, right? So when someone says we as women, I do identify with that because I, I have those experiences and people still gender me despite me coming out so in a certain way. So um, it's a difficult one. I think I, I, I identify with women politically more than I do personally. And I don't think that's like a contradiction if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, no, so, yeah, so Maddie's been working with us for, I think when I met you, Maddie, last May. Maybe May or June. And yeah, Maddie's been like really, really helpful in teaching us about, you know, how it was non-binary, about, you know, helping us put together the queer panel, what we can and can't say, and teaching us and educating us on different subjects that we are we don't know enough about. So it is a massive part of the campaign that we will be looking at all the different communities that can get involved. Um, and also looking at subjects and questions that are awkward and difficult and people don't want to look at. So, yeah. um, you know, when you were saying about Marsha, you know, we will be going into speaking to sex workers as well. We are going to go into so many different avenues that people generally don't feel comfortable going into. And a lot of that is, like you said, Jill as well, and Maddie, it's because people are uncomfortable because they don't know what to say. They're scared of saying the right thing. Uh, the wrong yeah. thing but it's just an educational piece and having worked with Maddie it's really you know it's interesting to be able to you can just ask the questions if you don't know something just ask the question you know and learn yeah. rather than stay ignorant um so it's been fascinating um and uh yeah Maddie is a, a massive part of you know the campaign and teaching us as we go as well so Maddie, thank you so much. Um, so next up is Samantha. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity today of uh, being on the panel and sharing my story. 
Um, so from a very early age, around four, I always knew that I wanted to work in an office. So I'd always use my mum's coffee table as my desk, play on the landline back in the good old days, make random phone calls to organisations, um, always writing, always got a pen and paper. I just knew that I wanted to work in an office and that was kind of my main goal at four years old. At eight, I had electric typewriter for Christmas, where I taught myself to copy, copy type and touch type, still with the aim of wanting to work in an office. At 14, I decided to go to night school at my local college and I enrolled on an accredited uh, typing course. So I was the only child there. It was obviously full of uh, lots of women who were amazing at typing. Um, and I was just pleased to be amongst those women at very early age. Uh, I successfully passed the typing course. Again, still wanted my own office. Didn't know what kind of area I wanted to go into. As long as I had a desk, a computer and a phone, then I felt really happy. Went to school, passed my GCSEs. They weren't the best results, but I got through them and I went on to college. I decided to do um, a three year business studies course. So I did the intermediate and the advanced. Again, I'd still just got this, this goal of having my own office and then I was quite happy. It was during that course that I decided I wanted to work in um, solicitors and perhaps work my way up as a paralegal a solicitor, who knows, maybe a barrister. That was the aim. Um, I successfully passed my college course at 19. I left college and I got my first job at a firm of solicitors. I was so happy. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I'd worked so hard to where I wanted to be. And at 19, I got my first job and it was in my own office. It was a small office. I got my own desk, got my computer and my phone. And I was um, a legal secretary in the conveyancing department. So where you buy and sell houses, which I love because I love looking at all the pictures and being nosy, all the different houses that people lived in. Um, so I, I was quite proud. I was quite pleased of what I'd achieved at such a young age. Um, and I was working my way up to be a uh, paralegal. Life for me at that point was amazing. I was still living at home, had a fantastic social life, plenty of savings. You know, um, life was just really, really good. Um, I went out one Friday night to my local pub, like I did every Friday. And that's where I met him. Um, and in the blink of an eye, my life completely changed. So I met him in our local pub and instantly I was attracted to this guy. It sounds really cheesy when you say it out loud, but our eyes met and I was really attracted to him and I just knew that I wanted to be with him. So when he called me over to his table where he was sitting with him uh, and his friend, I sat down Um, he made me feel so relaxed, so at ease. I just opened up to him about anything and everything within the first half an hour of speaking to him. So he knew almost everything about me in that instant. He knew where I lived, he knew where I worked, he knew who my friends were. And obviously he knew where my local pub was. Um, I really, really liked him. We seemed to get on really, really well. He just had this, this knack of saying all the right things to make me feel really special. Um, so when he asked me to go to the next pub with him and his friend, I didn't hesitate, had no, no reason not to. And we went off to the next pub and that's where he told me he really, really liked me. And from that moment on, we, we were kind of inseparable, I guess. Within two weeks of meeting him, I moved into his flat um, and he was still this charming guy who just knew how to make me feel special, who just had this ability to make me the centre of his world by saying all these lovely things. And then one day he kept saying, the only reason he got your job is by sleeping with your boss. And no one had ever, ever questioned this before, what, how I got my job or anything like this. So I found it a little bit bizarre, but I never, ever questioned it at any point. Um, and then the first time he hit me uh, was in the bedroom. We were having a conversation. I tried to leave the bedroom and he pulled me back. And as I spun round, he gave me a backhand, I split my lip. Um, we both stood there, both in utter shock. He seemed more shocked than I did. So in my mind, I was like, did this really happen? What, what did I do? What did I say wrong? What, what did I do to make him hit me? He started crying immediately. He was so apologetic, promised it would never, ever happen again. 
um, and I, I brushed it under the carpet. I didn't, didn't think anything of it. And then little things kind of subtly crept into the relationship where now, now I'm out on the outside looking in. Um, it was quite clear that I was very, very controlled in that relationship. But in the midst of it, when it's all new and it's all exciting and you're at the honeymoon period of that relationship, you don't see it as control at all. So when he said to me one night, oh, don't go and see your mom, stay in and watch a film. There's me thinking, oh, you know, he's so lovely. He wants to spend all this time with me. When in reality, he was cutting me off from my support network. He was taking me away from my mom, who I had an amazing relationship with my mom. Um, and I existed with this abuser for three years. And in November 2006, he slapped me for the last time when I was holding our 10 month old daughter in my arms. He um, split my lip open whilst I was holding her. And that for me was the moment I knew I had to change that situation. I had to get her out of that situation as quickly as I could. Um, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. Um, I was absolutely petrified of this person. When I first met him, those butterflies in my stomach was love because I did think I loved him. But towards the end of that relationship, those butterflies in my stomach was fear. I was absolutely petrified of this man. Um, during our three year relationship, he strangled me, he'd beaten me up, he'd kicked me, um, he'd locked me in the flat, um, wouldn't let me out of the flat, which is why I lost my job as a legal secretary. He threw my keys out of the seventh floor window, so I couldn't even make a phone call to, to make an excuse to my boss. I managed to escape two days later and the first place I went was my workplace because for me I thought that was my safe haven I thought that was where I'll get help and support and I remember trying to explain to my boss what was happening at home which I found really difficult because at that time I didn't even know what was happening to myself to, to try and explain that to someone else was really really hard and I was instantly sacked I was sacked on the spot um my career history I've never been late I, I was always early I, always gave everything 100% um, but little did that boss know through lack of education and awareness was that I was a victim of domestic abuse and now the perpetrator could abuse me 24 7 I've got now I've got no financial independence of my own so it was really hard for me to leave even if I wanted to but for me as I said that the moment was in 2006 when I got my 10 month old daughter in my arms and I just knew for her sake I had to leave um, and it was it was so hard because he knew everything about me. He'd always monitored my movements. He knew where my parents lived. He knew everything about me. Um, this happened on a Friday night. And on the Monday morning, I, I remember getting up and putting my daughter straight into a pram. She still got a baby grow on. I made some excuse that I was going to the shop because that was the only place I could go out alone, even though I was always bombarded with phone calls and text messages wanting to know where I was and who I was talking to. And I just remember jumping on the bus and going to my local police station. And I walked in and I, I was just at rock bottom at that point. And the police knew me because I'd made many, many um, state statements before, but I'd always dropped them because he promised to change because he loved me and it would never happen again. Um, but on that day, I was adamant, no, this is it. I've got to do it now. I made that statement. And on the very same day, I um, ordered an um, injunction order. So I went to court on that day and an injunction order was issued. And I'd like to say life was really good from that moment on. But it's really, really difficult to escape a perpetrator of domestic abuse, especially when you have a child with that person as well. So even though I was no longer existing in that environment, he was still controlling. When that letter landed on my floor from his solicitor, when he wanted to drag me through the family courts to see our daughter, at first I got mixed emotions. I thought, oh my gosh, he's going to really prove me wrong. He really wants to be a good father. He wants his daughter in his life. But when we actually got to court, and it's a very, very long process for those who've never been through that um, journey, it's a very long process. He never turned up to any of the appointments. He'd make excuses not to turn up. When he did turn up, he was just abrupt and really rude to the judges and the staff in, in, that, um, in that court. And in time, I think it lasted over three years that he was dragging it out. He was instructing different solicitors. 
And again, it was all about power and control. It was him controlling me because I had to go to court when his solicitor instructed me and things like that. And then it was thrown out of court. And um, I was kind of relieved at that point for me personally. But as a mother, I was I was still mixed because it was still my daughter's father, whatever way I looked at it. And she she didn't know him from 10 months old because I'd left and I, I always said no to contact because I felt that was the right decision for me at the time for my daughter. Um, and then I had um, a family support worker from our local Shore Start Centre and I just registered with all the mother and toddler groups that I could. I took it ev to every single one so she could build up confidence and so could I too because he controlled every aspect of my life. I couldn't go out. Anyone I spoke to, whether that was male or female, I was constantly accused of having an affair with them. He'd always go through my mobile phone and check all my messages. So it was as though I had to learn how to live again and I had to learn how to build up these relationships with people in my life. So I started volunteering at the Shore Start Centre in the offices. And one day the volunteering coordinator said, have you ever thought about helping other people who have been in that situation? And I just remember looking at this lady and just going, no, no, I can't do that. No, no, not for me. But she'd planted a seed and I'd never had anybody there for me when I was in that situation. My support was an eight week awareness course of everything I'd been through. And I was referred there by social services, which was the only reason I did that course, because I was frightened if I didn't I would take away my daughter so I kept thinking about this would I like to help others and I thought yes yes I would so in 2009 I set up my own support group called SODA which stands for survivors of domestic abuse and it simply started off as a Facebook page it's still very active today it's um, a locked secret support group where people who've been uh, in that situation can come together without judgment to share their stories and from there on, it's progressed a little bit like Madeline, where I just raise as much awareness of domestic abuse as I possibly can. Because I believe if someone had done that for me, I would have left sooner rather than later. It's one of those situations where it's really hard to explain unless you've, you've been in that situation. And when I escaped from him and I was handed a questionnaire, it was all about coercive control. And I never knew how control I'd been until that point and I just thought there must be so many other people men and women going through this and and not even knowing that it's abuse so I use social media and the media as a huge platform to simply raise awareness for other people and uh, my that is my passion raising awareness so I, I've spoken on podcasts I do radio interviews tv interviews and I write for a local newspaper and as Maddie said, it's one of those where you get the feedback from people and people have found the strength and courage to get in touch with you and just say thank you, just because we've shared our story and they can relate. Um, and I found that it's a lot of people who have never spoke to anyone about it before, but they've been out of that relationship for a long time, perhaps, and they've been happily married. But listening to somebody share their story is, is clarification for them that they were right it was never their fault and it's like you're just clarifying that what they was thinking is true so soda is still running today and it's still very very active it's um a community group at the moment but i am just in the process of setting up as a cic which is a lot like a charity but without the red tape so it's going to be more structured and it'll give me more opportunities to use my voice and help others so that, that's where I am at the moment. And that's my story in a nutshell. Thank you so much. Uh, I thought I could get myself off mute there. Do you know what? It's so sad to hear that you didn't have the support that you needed. What a way to turn it around. That's so inspirational. Uh, Maddie, did you have a question? Yes, um, thanks for sharing that with us, Samantha. Um, it's a story that I've, I've heard too often, sadly, but um, I just wanted to ask, you know, what, what can we do to support survivors either while it's happening or in the aftermath? Um, just like, what, what are some things that we can, we can do? Again, I think it's about raising awareness. So social media is really, really good for that. 
I think it's really hard to actually support someone who's actually going through it at the time because we've been brainwashed to believe that everyone hates us, no one's going to believe us, and the only stable person in our life at that point is our abuser. So sometimes really hard to reach out but it's just about knowing that you're there when they're ready to speak out so it's just understanding that they might not be able to answer your phone call straight away not because they don't want to but because that phone is being controlled so I think it's about educating ourselves really and just letting that person know I'm here if and when you need us and it's about believing them as well because I think when I when I told people what I was going through, a lot didn't believe me because to everyone else, he was a caring partner. He, he helped the little old lady across the road. He'd always help his mom. He always seemed really popular. And when the abuse happens behind closed doors, it's really difficult for the survivor to prove what they're going through. So again, I think it's just about educating ourselves and that awareness and just saying, I'm here if you need anything. That's all I wanted when I was in that situation. I just wanted someone to know what was going on and just say to me, I'm here for you if you need it. It would have planted a seed and in time it would have given me that courage to actually reach out for that help. Thanks, Samantha. Madeline, did you have a question? I don't have a question, but just, oh, Samantha, I was rooting for you, listening to your Thank story. you so oh, much. I Thank know, you. I, I think I mentioned I worked at Women's Aid for 14 years, so I just as you said, no judgment, no, don't ask any questions, let them speak when they're ready. And it's, it's a real paradox because when you're in it, you don't see it because it becomes your normal. And it's the further you're away from a situation and the more you're with good people that support you and that are there for genuine reasons, then you begin to go, oh, him opening my text messages and reading them, that's not good. Him opening my post every day, that's not good. Him telling me that my, that dinner was shite and putting it in the bin, that, you know the ways that you're undermined and erodes your confidence and your self-belief okay. just so you have to rely on this one person um and abuse is just all power and control that's yeah, all absolutely now you've taken back the control and the power and you're empowering other people so yeah are oh, just i oh, love you thank you oh thank you so much thank you well done amazing thank you so much samantha yeah. Last but not least, our next speaker up is Jill. Oh, thank you so much. I just had a quick question for Samantha. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Kind of, I thought it was absolutely fantastic that she was brave enough to share that story. Um, and, and one of the, the things that she touched on was about not understanding coercive control. Um, there is a, I saw Laura and the Gladwell Girls Club involved in another project similarly recently about educating young girls and women at an early age usually from the ages of 12 and upwards about what the indicators are and what the red flags are to watch out for and um, I had a similar situation to, to Samantha it wasn't really what I was planning on talking about on this um, but it ties into what I was talking about which was overcoming fears mm -hmm. um, and barriers and I just wondered does Samantha feel that that helping educate young people on the red flags about the the more nuance type red flags as opposed to the, the first time they hit you but even before the look the comment that was made about her work and the, the situation that she found herself in there do you think does she think if she had been aware of that at a younger age she might have spotted those red flags earlier because that's something i asked myself as well yeah absolutely i've often said um the abuse started when uh, he isolated me but only because um, I didn't know what coercive control was. This was the early 2000s, so we didn't really know what coercive control was then, but now we do. But still, a lot of people don't think they're being abused because they're not being hit. So like you say, we automatically, when we talk about domestic abuse, we often focus on the physical, but the abuse starts long, long before that. So for me, I believe that the abuse started as soon as I met him in that pub, as soon as I sat next to him and I opened up about my story, who I was, what I do, that is when he grew me. He knew exactly, in my opinion, he knew exactly what he was doing the night he met me. So um, coercive control, learning about coercive control at a young age, I think will be absolutely life saving because it's instant. It's, it happens instantly. So it's like he said, you're not going out dressed like that. Why are you going out dressed like that? um my mobile phone that was completely controlled so you often get oh but he looks through my messages because he cares about me he wants to know who my friend or, or she that they care about me that they're not abusive 
oh, when they ask me when I've, where I've been or where I'm going, it's because they care for me. We, we need to get the red flags and coercive control out there constantly at a young age because that has the most impact on someone who has been in that situation because we can't see it and we don't necessarily feel it as abuse either. I thought he loved me when he wanted to spend all that time with me. I thought it, was, it wasn't. It was about that control, that power and control. I did a, a, a campaign last year called MTAB, which stands for More Than a Bruise, because I get lots of people say to me, oh, I'm not being abused, I'm not being hit, but they'll explain, you know, they'll turn up at the workplace unexpectedly or they'll bombard them with phone calls. You are being controlled, that is abuse. So yeah, absolutely, red flags are absolutely detrimental to, to for everyone to know about. And even with friends as well, if friends can identify these signs, you know, someone who's really, really bubbly, who is now really withdrawn, that's a red flag. He stopped me from going to work. He stopped me going out with friends. He stopped me doing everything. And sometimes we think, oh, it's a new relationship. They're being like that because they're with their new partner. They don't think it's because of their new partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Just one more thing, you know, in the 14 years I worked at Women's Aid over in East Cobra, I hardly ever saw a woman that was beaten. And every woman came in, it's not that bad, he doesn't hit me. Because then in those days we had these awful adverts on TV that said love and hate, and you saw a woman getting hit and the bruises. It's so subtle and it's drip by drip effect. And before you know it, you don't even know it. It's just, it takes over. And it's, as you said, it's all the little things. It's it's the control in you, it's financial abuse, it's sexual abuse, it's emotional abuse, it's, it doesn't have to be physical abuse and if anyone is listening, you know, just contact your local women's aid group, get support, don't stand okay. any longer. And it's often, sorry, when I heard you say when he hit me with my 10 month old and my baby, women used to come to the advice centre, they say, he hit me in front of my kids, you know, because you, you have eroded so much your self-worth, but if they do it to my children, that mother lioness came out like, can't have that. He hit my Absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've eroded ourselves. We're not worth it anymore. But it's when children were involved. So, yeah, it's so important what you're doing. It's really, really, really sadly needed as well. My dad, my dad actually asked me that question. He said, why, why didn't you leave sooner? And I was like, I didn't have a reason. He said, but what about yourself? And I just looked at him blankly because all my self-confidence, all my self-worth had gone completely. But like you say, once you've got that child in your arms, it's like, no, I'm not having this. But I do believe that if I hadn't have had my daughter, then my story would be very different. I would have stayed. I, I do know that. I would have stayed and I probably wouldn't be here today. So she saved my life, uh, really. She really did save my life. Thank you so much, Samantha. Jill. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, what I banded off about, I'm going to win this because there's so much being said during this live that I think, funnily enough, it's actually given me one of the secret questions that I asked um, the lady at the start, Madeline, was about guilt and talking out about things for fear of not upsetting those around you. But I mean, I never thought I'd say um, today that I'm able to talk about this because my grand's no longer here because it was always her I didn't want to upset. She didn't really know fully the ins and outs of what had happened um, and how, I, how I've got to where I am. She only seemed like the aftermath after I had left the situation that I was in. So to cut a long story short, I know Laura wants me to speak a wee bit about business. So I was born and raised in East End of Glasgow to an entrepreneurial type family. They weren't um, millionaires by any stretch of the imagination, but they were a very good entrepreneurial family. They had multiple businesses. I was raised by my grandmother and my grandfather. And my mother has had me quite young and my father wasn't in my life. So my grandfather was the father figure in my life and he was very much about female empowerment and so was my grandmother. They were all very much, you you go for your dreams and you can do anything and I was the baby of the family so I had everyone kind of rooting for me which was which was great. Went to the local primary school and at that time they did National Fives, um, that was a junior testing type thing and when I was 10 they decided that I should get an assisted place at an all girls private school in the west end of Glasgow so I was shipped off to there. First couple of years were great. Then I hit my teenage years and the school amalgamated with another school. It's a completely different dynamic. Didn't work out too well. Um, my granddad took a stroke. Um, so that was a big part of my life. And uh, I didn't really have his support anymore in terms of the nurturing. But my grandmother was still very much involved in figuring out what I wanted to do with my life and, and different things like that. And I was always expected to go to university. 
to get these really high grades, go to uni and, and everything else. To cut a long story short, my grandfather died when I was 15 and that was quite a shock. And because I'd went to an all-girls private school and my family hadn't wanted me to be interacting with boys, I wasn't allowed to have like boys phone in the house or anything like that. Um, I was out walking one day with my mum. We were walking between Alexander Parade and Duke Street where we live. And um, this, what I thought was a Justin Timberland, uh, Justin Timberlake lookalike, Wolf whistled me in the street and shouted, Oi, Blondie, what you fondy? And I thought that was the most amazing thing ever because I'd seen him around about and the girls fancied him and all different things and I'd caught his attention. So I thought that was amazing. My mother practically dragged me down the street saying, In no way in God's green earth are you going near that guy? And that just made it worse because you know the minute you're told you can't have something, you want it. So I made it my wee mission to bump into him at the corner where the Haddos was that weekend. And uh, it started from there. He ended up with my phone number. Um, I was close to getting expelled from school at that point because I just wasn't interested in school anymore. As much as academically, I was really, really good. Decided to not show up for the exams. So I left school with no exams. And they pretty much expelled me. You know, they did expel me. They asked me to leave or they were going to expel me. Um, and all of that happened at the same time. I had the entrepreneurial stuff going on at the same time. So my, my family were saying, like, you need to do something. So I was opening bodies with my family, which was my first business just before I was 16. It's the family business of Tannin Challenge and Alexandra Parade, which grew exponentially. So telling this story, all of these other things, these great, amazing things were happening on one side in a personal business relationship. And on the other side, I had all the carry-ons going on with this particular person. I was 15 turning 16. He was 21. He already had a child by another girl who had tried to warn me about the situation and she was drowned out by noise she's paranoid she caused this he didn't do this she's not letting him see the kids had all of that been on and I stupidly believed him and his friends so the first thing I would say is if you ever get anyone coming to you and giving you a red flag pointer even if you think they're jealous and this that and the next thing they're trying to get back with their ex listen to it and note it you don't have to believe it but just keep it in your head that somebody's actually taking the time to come and tell you this when they are petrified of that person I thought everything was great. Very quickly, the relationship turned quite controlling. All of the things that Samantha was saying about the phone and not wanting to speak to people, he would argue people with people in the street, turn up at my work and not want to leave. Um, my family were really against this relationship and they really tried to get me out of that situation, which is what I was talking <clears throat> um, to the first lady about, about shame and embarrassment, because so many people were supporting me and trying to get me away from that situation. And I had, not blinkers, but I was just adamant that I was going to make this work. I wanted to prove everybody wrong. It turned violent fairly quickly, and it wasn't private violent. This was in the street. People were seeing it. My family were really well known in the area. They were not a family to be feared, but they, they, weren't, they weren't ones that would tolerate that type of thing happening. But people were going to them and saying, do you know he's done this in the street? He's done this outside the shop. Um... I remember right before my granddad's funeral, like literally the day before my granddad's funeral, because I wasn't answering the phone to him and I was trying to deal with my family, he went and tried to smash the windows in the shop and I still went back with him. It escalated to a point where my family says, pick or choose. I left the house, my family home. I didn't speak to my grandmother for three years. This was like escalated beyond anything. And the minute I moved in with him and got the house and everything else, it just got 10 times worse. And he was kind of relating it back to that he'd lost his child and he wanted a child. So we planned to have a child, which when I look back, I think is absolutely crazy. So <clears throat> plans that pregnancy. Um, it was still violent throughout the pregnancy. And I stayed during that. He was throwing things about the house. Um, he hit me once during the pregnancy and that should have been the final line to leave. But no, all the apologies came and I stayed. I wasn't involved in the business anymore at that point because the family were saying, no, you can't be here with all that drama going on in the background and the business was eventually sold for lots of different reasons, but that was one of the factors and things in it as well. Um, he then hit me in the street and my family, they really weren't listening to me saying I want to make this work. And it escalated to the point where one of my family members was almost murdered in the middle of Alexander Parade in broad daylight. So his father went to prison for that and I still stayed. Still being beat up through that. And thinking, it's okay, I'm defending myself, everything will be fine. And I had the baby by this point as well. Um, so I felt trapped in that, that circumstance. 
there was one time I left and I actually went to Women's Aid and they were they were fantastic. They put me in a, an overnight housing situation. But when I seen that in comparison to the lifestyle that I was used to living, I stupidly went, no, I'm going to try and make this work and went back again. And that was near Christmas. Uh, and it was probably about two weeks after that, a situation escalated so bad in the house that I nearly died in that house that night. I've still got the scars from that. If you look close enough, you'll probably see them. Um, and I left in the middle of the night with the baby and I never went back. But like Samantha's saying, it's not just as easy as leaving. It's that fear of leaving and where are you going to go and what you're going to do. And I was too embarrassed and too ashamed to phone my family at that point. And they would have welcomed me back with open arms. But I thought, I've caused so much trouble. Everything's happened. They're not going to want to have anything to do with me, despite the fact that they were saying, come back. Um, so I had to kind of rely on other friends and family to help me and to get back on my feet. And there are organisations out there that will help you. So please never, ever think that you are alone. Because in my head, I was totally alone even though my family were there and all I had to do was pick up the phone. In my head, I wouldn't allow myself to do that. So sometimes it's about being the bigger person and admitting that you've made a mistake. Your family usually always love you and they're going to try and help you anyway. So sometimes it's just about overcoming your own issues and reaching out and, and saying, I've made a mistake. Um, we went through the whole court case thing. He lost parental rights. But still to this day, my child is 19 now. I still get the text messages and all the crazy stuff. I'm going to come to your work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So be very, very careful in your choice of men. <laughs> this is, is one of the things that I would say. But the the point of my, my coming on to talk today was to talk about overcoming obstacles and overcoming fear. So with, with the one respect, that was one overcoming a fear of, of leaving and what situation was I going to be in after that. But I had to rebuild my life after that situation. So getting back into work, starting another business, um, things like that with a child. Because I'd left school without the qualifications, I couldn't get into to university. So I was taking jobs that would allow me to kind of progress whilst doing entrepreneurial things on the side. Um, and one of the biggest things for me was the fear of trying to get into education again, because I thought they would reject me. One of the things that I want to talk about is when you're looking to develop yourself, whether it's starting your own business or developing your own business or transitioning from your main source of employment to what you're maybe perceiving as your sideline, is that aspect of fear. It doesn't have to be a jump straight from the frying pan to the fire. You can do gradual movements. If you can't afford to go to university, don't think that that's the be all and end all. There's other things you can do. There's so many free resources online that you can access and educate yourself. That bit of paper is not the be all and end all. You can do personal development and reflect it in different things that you're doing in your workplace or different things you're doing in charities like Thriving Survivors to develop your skill set and help you progress in the workplace and things like that. And these are things that you can be doing at home. If, if, even if you're on benefits and you don't have childcare and things, a lot of things can be downloaded from the internet. One of the things that I said to uh, a girl recently when she was she was wanting to do an MBA and couldn't afford it because they're, they're very expensive and they're very time consuming as well. It's quite difficult to work and do an MBA at the same time is to get hold of the reading list and download it and read the reading list and try and download slides and things like that and, and educate yourself. So with regards to that, that was one of the things that I, that I wanted to touch on. Um, and the final thing that I had been asked to speak about was the progression of business. Because Medicare started six years ago, we will be six on the 24th of March. So I started Kids Medicare with £5,000. I was working as a hospital manager in a private hospital, spotted an opportunity <clears throat> and had access to the resources in terms of the skill set of surgeons that I needed. I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to create in the marketplace and what service offerings I wanted to give that weren't currently there for um predominantly females, because it is predominantly females that use our service. Um, and I took the £5,000 and invested it, invested it in making sure people knew about that business and what we did and how we were different from everybody else. At that point, that was a, it was a big risk for me because I was upsetting my employers. Um, I was putting myself out there after already having one failed business in a similar industry um, because I'd, I'd made a wrong choice of partner and I hadn't really been keeping a grip on the things that I should have been keeping a grip on. And in short, the bank account had let someone else have control of the bank account, which was a bad idea. Um, so 
it's about learning from your mistakes and making sure that you don't repeat them. Um, so when I took the leap with Kid Medicare, I didn't really know where I was going with it. I had dreams, I had ideas, and they weren't small dreams. It wasn't, I want a lifestyle business. It was, I want a massive, massive business. Um, I used to see things about mum entrepreneurs and female boss and everything else. And as much as I respect ladies for doing that, I wanted to be bigger than that. I wanted to compete with the guys. I wanted to compete with the big companies. Like I wanted to be like Optical Express because when I'd be in rooms um, with the entrepreneurial networks that I was in, it was much bigger businesses. So my ambitions were to scale to that size. Six years on, I'm at that level. And it's all about constantly overcoming fears of growth. So initially when I started Kids Medicare, I did everything myself. I was wearing all the different hats. I was doing the marketing. I seen every single patient. I managed the finances. Um, I managed the protocols. I was doing everything. And there comes a time when your business starts getting too big. And that control aspect that you've got, and I think it sometimes comes from the situation, the personal situation that I've spoken about, fear of not being in control of your own destiny or fear of somebody being able to pull the rug from underneath you or bugger something up for you that, that like had happened in the field business when you when you trust someone. So I remember when Kids Medicare was about two years old, two and a bit years old, I took on my first member of staff and I actually poached her from our largest competitor at the time, which was Transform. Um, her name's Gabriella. She's my angel, Angel Gabriella. And I remember saying to her, like, I'm not sure how this is going to work because I'm used to doing everything myself and I need to find a way to, to work with you because you've got such a great skill set. You've got such skills to bring to this business, such energy. And she had ideas about what she wanted to do as well. So it was like sharing my baby to a certain extent. And I can honestly say it was the best thing that I did to bring on other people and to trust them and to give them the authority and the freedom to have an input and to have um, views on how we can go forward. We've continued that model throughout the build um, of the business. And we now have, I think I've got eight patient care coordinators who we, we've taken on. Some are from um, competitors, which we've coached over, or they've seen how could Medicare do things and they've wanted to be with us, so they've moved over. Um, some are from other industries that we've taken on and trained them up. Because uh, Medicare is a pro predominantly female managed business. All of our top end staff are female. The surgeons are male predominantly. Uh, alongside the anaesthetist, but all the nursing staff are female, all the patient care coordinators are female. And this ethos of overcoming fears and dedicating yourself to, to personal growth is something that we echo throughout our whole culture of, of employment. We've got ladies within our organisation who've overcome a lot of issues that we've, we've spoken about today, whether it's been um, divorces or childcare issues or things like that, that are supportive workplaces there. I know Samantha, I was mortified to hear Samantha's experience of when she opened up to her boss, the immediate reaction was, was to sack her instead of support her. Um, so it's a really unfortunate experience. And I would like to think that as women in business, when we're in that situation as managers and owners, if any of our employees came to us with a similar situation, we would have the strength and the, the moral integrity to say, let me help you. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean leave that situation immediately. Maybe that person's not ready to leave, but to support them and, and not take away the financial resource that can help them move through that transitional period um, and to be brave enough not to worry about maybe that partner coming to the workplace. Because I think sometimes that can be a fear with employers in that situation that an abusive partner is, is going to start making waves um, for, for the business. Um, so. So for any employers listening, try and, and be brave and support your, your workforce if they're in a situation like that and look out for things that maybe they're, they're not telling you if there's repeat patterns of coming in late to work or hiding things with makeup or saying that they're sick when they were fine the day before. These are things that I would definitely encourage women to, to kind of look out for. Thank you so much, Jill. That was amazing. It's good to hear, you know, your personal and the business side and how you've managed to build your business, taking into your account all your personal experiences and making it a, 
a better place for other people and the support, like with Samantha having the support there that maybe other people doesn't have. Maddie, you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, um, thanks again for sharing your story. Um, I just wanted to ask, because I got the impression, you know, you were 15, 16, when you said you started to fancy this guy. Um, I wonder if there's maybe a positive notion here about embracing the fact that 15, 16 year old girls do have a sexuality, you know, like they have sexual desires. And instead of just trying to pull them away. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's much younger than that. I mean, I remember yeah. so anything like 13, 14, there was yeah. girls around me engaging in different acts and getting into relationships and things. I think as parents as well, we absolutely fear this. I remember yeah. when, when my child was, was younger and when they were 13, they were presenting as male. They had no interest in anything relationship-wise, but my friends who had daughters, they were absolutely petrified that their daughter might go out on a date with someone. And you're thinking, you're actually putting up a barrier to your child speaking to you about what they're doing so then they'll do it behind your back they're going to do it anyway <sighs> yeah absolutely that's that was basically what I was going to ask you about is just yeah, yeah would it is it maybe healthier to just recognize yeah like your yeah. your child has a sexuality it's it's uncomfortable but as you say yeah. if we if we recognize it and are and have office open and honest conversations about it it might prevent people going for I mean I've seen it happen with my old friends going for yeah. older guys who don't have their best interests at heart mm -hmm. um, and they yeah. kind of do it on the down low and maybe with a bit of shame involved as well and uh, it's just not positive and it's not helpful yeah, yeah. before before I had Cosmedicare I worked in Sandyford which is sexual reproductive and emotional health so there's lots of different arms of Sandyford um, but it does have a young people's service um, and it does have TOPAR which is termination of pregnancy um, in the young people's service one of the biggest things that I found difficult to deal with was young people in that situation that couldn't go to their parents. They couldn't be talking about the situations that they'd got into, whether they'd caught an STI or there was different things, different dynamics in the relationship that would come up when they were speaking to the nurses as part of a screen, which they were being responsible in doing. And the nurses were spotting the red flags that we spoke about with Samantha and trying to kind of educate the, the girls and the boys, because there was things happening with boys as well. Um, trying to educate them on spotting red flags and being careful um, and if they did fall pregnant that there are options that you need to speak and that there's, there's people within those organisations who will help with that communication process and it, it's terrifying at the time I mean you can imagine um, some of the situations that, that we were hearing but again it's, it's overcoming that fear to, to speak out and to use your voice in a, in a powerful and constructive way to be in control of your own destiny. Absolutely. I just wanted to add as well, um, I'm an ambassador for an organisation called Employers Initiative on Domestic Abuse, which is shortened to IDA, which is E-I-D-A, and they equip and educate employers and employees to identify the early warning signs of domestic abuse. And on their website, they've got lots of free uh, resources that bosses can use in their workplace to support staff who might make a disclosure so if anyone's listening mm -hmm. or if anyone wants to uh, check their work out I would highly recommend it. Oh, fantastic. That's great Samantha that's really good uh, information thank you so much. Madeline? Can I just say Jill um, this is why these conversations are so important because you never intended to share that and it just shows me that yeah. courage is contagious and it just it's more evidence for me to see that look what happens when we share our stories it's like the ripple effect you then went on to share your story of domestic abuse which is now gonna not just help you because that's not your shame it's going to help other women as well to unburden themselves go and get support realize that they were being controlled but and also fantastic success on your business that's a brilliant journey but it was, i just love these conversations because of what comes out and the synchronicity of how we're all so connected but ultimately it's it does take guts to share what you've been through because there is so much shame but it's it's just it's brilliant we need to have these courageous conversations more thank you heather yeah. thank you maddie for organizing it you know when you when you were speaking and i'd asked the question at the beginning and i was i was talking about shame it was more about the the embarrassment for me because i spent a long time as as because medicare was growing and was was 
being in the news and things, he would be sending messages saying, oh, I'm going to leak these photographs. He'd photographs from me when I was 15 and bras and pants and saying he was going to leak them to the sun. I was mortified because my profile was being built as this entrepreneurial businesswoman who's so strong and things like that. And I was thinking, oh my God, the last thing I want coming out is pictures with me with cuts and bruises and black eyes and him saying what had happened and I'd taken his child away. I was petrified that I was going to be framed as some sort of absolute man-hater who'd destroyed some man's life. That was the narrative that I had keeping going round in my head. Yeah, for but me, I had yeah, it is actually, I think people would say, despite what she went through, she has built this amazing business. Look at where she started. In fact, when I hear it, it be the opposite, but because you're caught by that trauma of the abuse, that's where your mind goes. But actually, it, it just backs your story up even more. You know, you were going through all that and you still did this. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you can definitely overcome obstacles. I mean, people, people talk, like when I speak to people and they're saying, I'm trying to build a business, but I've got things going on with childcare. I've got other things going on with family. Whilst that was happening, my, my child was diagnosed with autism, was sent to a special school. He went through five schools before they were at the age of 13 um, because the schools couldn't cope with the additional support needs. So I, I had that going on whilst doing the university degree, whilst managing a contract-based business because I was a contractor um, in consultancy. There, you do need support from your family. I'm not going to be a, a um, Kim Kardashian or Molly May and say, get up and work, work, work. It, it doesn't work like that. People have got things that they need to deal with and they sometimes don't have access to the opportunities to be able to make themselves a success, which is why I think it's really important to talk about the things that you can do at home to better yourself and to better your opportunities without having to invest £5,000 or go to, to universities and things like that. There are other ways and that's where organisations like Thriving Survivors and like Skillset Development Scotland, they are, they are there to help. It's just about knowing where to go to access them. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, I think today from all our speakers, it's uh, it shows the power we have in us when we need it, when the time is right. Um, and I think my biggest takeaway from this, from listening to you all, is definitely that actually an education piece on knowing the red flags and being there for people when they're ready is going to be really, really key. And that's definitely something that we'll take away and implement maybe that educational side of the red flags and how we can support people out there for when they're ready um, into the campaign. So thank you all so much. Um, at the start, I was like, we'll definitely get it done in an hour, but you know what, you've got amazing conversations and um, women like you on the panel, it's not something we're gonna cut short. So we've gone half an hour over, so I will keep my ending to a minimum. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, if you want to learn more about the campaign, it's so what but what if .co.uk. Everything's on there. The panel events for the rest of the year are up there. And after every single panel, uh, Maddie writes a blog, so you can read that as well if you prefer to read than to watch uh, the video. And that has everything um, detailed down in there. At the end of the year, we will take all our findings, all the panel events, and create a document that will go to the Scottish and the UK government with everybody's asks um, and the findings from the year. Really exciting. One of ours of the taglines of the campaign is to create a safer future for the younger generations. And we have now completely put together our youth panel, which is ready to go on the 15th of April. So we have a really diverse group of um, you know, young people that are going to create our panel. And with that, how it will work is they will come together on the 15th and be introduced to you. We're not going to tell you who they all are until that date. And then after that, they will do a... Uh, sort of goggle box style um, watching of our, our panels and we'll record their view on it as well because some of the conversations we had within um, So What campaign is that, apart from you Maddie maybe, we are all older, we're really not in the youth category anymore, um, although I don't consider myself old, I keep getting told you're not in the youth category. So we decided actually, do you know, if we are trying to create these this change for young people, then surely we need young people's view and voice on it as well. So they will watch back all our campaigns, uh, campaign 
panel event and we'll record their reactions and their thoughts and then they'll get in, turned into additional blogs as well and we'll put all of the thoughts and feedback from everybody to make a much more rounded campaign uh, at the end. So that's really exciting. Um, we are, Laura is going to be speaking to all of the youth panel on Monday. So yeah, it, it's really lining up to be a brilliant, a brilliant group and a, a really good extra arm onto the campaign. Our next panel uh, with the non-youth is our perceptions panel, and that's the 22nd of April. And we're looking at how historical biases um, and current life perceptions from male to female, male to female, um, has really shaped how safety is today. We'll go back into, you know, when women used to stay at home to where we are now, our, our perceptions, what we see as perceptions, is that what the other sex sees as well? Is there a crossover? And we'll just delve into all the different little um, angles of it and see what it takes us um, and see how that, how that shaped the way we think today and how we use that to move forward. So it should be a really interesting conversation. And again, it's a really diverse panel we have for that too. Um, so I'm just looking at the comments and Ash is having a good laugh at my non-youth description. Um, so <laughs> hopefully the, the youth will, will bring in that other um, angle. So we have got lots of comments on Facebook. If our panel want to go and have a look and just answer any of them, that would be amazing. We will get this downloaded straight up onto the So What website. It will also be on all our social channels. You'll see it in One for Growth, Glasgow Girls Club, Thriving Survivors, So What Social. It will be on YouTube's website, The Lot. We'll get it everywhere we can. I'll send it all to our lovely panellists as well. And if you can share it, the more people that hear these conversations, the better. And thank you so much to everybody that's uh, listened to us and had the patience to uh, get through that extra half hour as well. I think it was definitely worth it. Everyone's uh, stories and contribution has been amazing. So thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you on the 15th and the 22nd. Heather, do you want to do the what ifs? Yeah, well, Sergeant Jill, did you have? Um, I just wanted to ask, there's a lot of charity type things that are being discussed here. Can you put the links in for where if people want to donate? Because I would like to donate to some of these charities. So it would be great if there was a link where we can support these people. Absolutely. We'll make sure that all this, all the information and links that people have discussed goes into it as well. Absolutely. Um, Maddie, I know you were going to ask me about our what ifs, and I didn't give everyone the heads up to this, so I'm going to put everyone on the spot here. So what we try and do is, at the end of every panel event, is ask people, what is their what if? So to give a bit of background on this quickly, that so what, but what if campaign, the name was created by a panel of survivors, and they're like, well, so what, all these campaigns are great, but they all just disappear. Uh, what if we created this platform for all organizations and safety um, campaigns to come together and actually make a long-term dif difference? Uh, so at every event we ask, if you had a, uh, a what if, what if you could change something? You know, what if you didn't have to um, speak to your friend on the phone walking home just to make you feel safe? What would be your what if? So Maddie, I'll come to you first, since you are good enough to remind me. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so my what if is, uh, what if we were taught about women's achievements in school in a way that recognised the sexist mechanisms through which women had been previously erased from historical narratives? So it's a very convoluted and <laughs> pretentious way to say, <laughs> what if we, what if we learned about women's achievements, but also how and why they were erased? I think that's a really important part of it as well. Thank you, Maddie. Samantha? My what if would be, what if all victims of domestic abuse were believed? Oh, that's a good one. I like that. Madeline? Oh, I've got so many. Oh, my. <laughs> what if the conviction rates in Scotland and the UK weren't so low and we haven't decriminalised rape? And what if police weren't full of misogyny and what if we actually took victims seriously and, and what if I heard somebody like me come into a school and share her story and what if I could found my voice years and years ago and I told you I could have just gone on forever but yeah amazing too many 
Amazing. Thank you, Madeline. And Jill? Mine's is a philosophical one. And it is, what if everything that happened to us was the universe's way of moulding us into where we're meant to be? All the trauma, all the things that we've been through, what if that can be used as a positive to lead us in our path to a positive future? What if we change our mindset? What if we try it if it doesn't work? But what if it does? Amazing. I love that. What a great one to end on. Ladies, thank you so much for being on the panel. Listen to everybody who's been watching and commenting. Thank you so much. Uh, please do, everyone, go and have a look at the comments on the Facebook. It's, um, it's really nice. It's, uh, you've got so much support there, everybody. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day.